I'm Norbert Gleicher, MD, and I'm the medical director and chief scientist here at the Center for Human Reproduction in New York City. I would like to talk to you today about a new research protocol which we recently initiated here. And by way of background, I will also go back a little bit and talk about two other related protocols that have been running already for some time. What I'm talking about is what some of our colleagues are calling ovarian rejuvenation. We here at CHR, we are, we are not very happy with this term because uh, it sounds a little quirky, frankly. It has really nothing to do with uh, rejuvenating ovaries. Uh, the concept of this treatment uh, is that as women's ovaries are getting older, uh, some of their follicles uh, that are still remaining, and the number is usually at this point relatively small, no longer respond to the usual stimulations, including fertility drugs. And uh, the theory behind this treatment is that it reactivates those remaining follicles. So there's no rejuvenation in the sense that new eggs are being produced or anything is really rejuvenated. Um, the idea is that dormant follicles are again becoming responsive. And how that is done is uh, by extracting a certain fraction of a patient's own blood which is called a platelet-rich plasma, or PRP, and that's why we call this the PRP treatment, uh, and then injecting tiny amounts of uh, the patient's own plasma fraction uh, into her ovaries. And since the, this one fraction, this PRP fraction, uh, contains certain cell populations and, and, and certain so-called cytokines, uh, it is believed that that's what's activating remaining follicles. Uh, and my emphasis here is on the word it is believed, because uh, this concept, uh, first the proposed and first uh, reported by colleagues in Europe, specifically in Greece, uh, is really still not established. And as I sit here, I cannot even tell you with certainty that it really works. Uh, what I can tell you is that we are now in our second year of investigating and that this new treatment or this new study that I'm here to, to describe is our third ongoing study on this subject. And that's why I said before that I have to make some introductory remarks. So while I will be talking today primarily about what we are calling PRP3, you need to understand why we are at number three uh, at, uh, as of this point. So roughly two years ago when we got interested in the subject after European colleagues started uh, doing this, uh, we decided if we are going to offer it to our patient, we will do it as a study. And since PRP initially was proposed for women with what's called primary ovarian insufficiency or premature menopause or premature ovarian failure, all interchangeably, uh, interchangeable terms, we decided this, to restrict this, the initial study, the PRP1 study only, to those women, and that meant women who were basically in early menopause under age 40. Uh, and uh, that study is still ongoing and is actually close to, to getting to an adequate size number uh, for us uh, to, to reach conclusions. Uh, but this study excluded everybody above age 40. And so as the word got out that we were doing the study, uh, we had a lot of patients above age 40 uh, who were in early menopause, but not under age 40 as the diagnosis of POI requires, 
who also wanted to participate. And so that's when we started PFP Study 2 for women who were no longer responding to stimulation, but were older than 40 years. And uh, that study, too, has been recruiting, and uh, we are getting closer to, to results. Uh, and since this study uh, actually attracted even more patients than the initial POI study, uh, we hope also to be able to report uh, results quite soon, even though we started PRP2 almost a year later than PRP1. Now, that brings me to PRP3, which started about uh, two months ago. Uh, and here we, for the first time, are not only investigating whether this treatment reawakens sleepy follicles and makes them responsive, uh, but we are now in this study using PRP injections in patients who do still produce eggs, but in insufficient numbers. So here the question is a very different one. It's no longer none versus some eggs. Here the question is fewer versus more eggs. Are we through this kind of treatment in women who produce very few eggs still able to get more eggs? Uh, and that is obviously a very important question because this is actually the biggest pool of patients who may benefit if PFP indeed increases egg and embryo numbers. And this is a prospectively randomized study uh, registered, which means that the computer decides whether a patient uh, receives the PFP injection or a placebo. But importantly, the placebo here is not uh, just uh, saline or, or you know, salt water or something like that. It is actually a different fraction of the patient's own blood, which has not been reported to do the same thing. So in a way, there may be an effect from that injection as well, uh, because it has been demonstrated that simply the, the repeated needling of ovaries and the destructions that this is inducing at the local level can reactivate some dormant follicles. And so though this is a placebo, this is a control, but we would not be surprised if that also gives us some effect. Uh, at the time of the injection, neither the doctor or the patient know whether she's receiving PFP or the other fraction. Uh, but afterwards, we're breaking code because if the patient did not conceive in that cycle, and it turns out that she didn't get the PFP in the following IVF cycle, she's automatically getting the PFP. It's a crossover, in other words. So every patient is assured of getting PFP at least in one of two cycles, and if you're lucky, in the first one. So that's pretty much everything I can tell you. Uh, our impression, and this is just an impression, and I re-emphasize that we do not have yet enough data to make final uh, conclusions. But our impression at that point is that PFP indeed is effective in some patients, not in all, by no means in all. But what we are trying to find out through these three studies is in whom, how many patients will respond and who can we predict in advance who will and will not uh, respond. Our impression has changed. Uh, frankly speaking, when we started this project, we were rather skeptical about the reports from our European colleagues. Um, but uh, we have come around because we have seen really some quite surprising results in all three studies so far. Thank you very much for listening and if there are any questions you always know where you can reach me and my colleagues. Bye bye.